Okay. Tell me what do you think it means or what would you consider a chemical bond? Give me like a rough definition of what a chemical bond would be. What'd you say? Two electrons joining. Okay, kind of, yes. What other things do we know about chemical bonds? Yeah, Jake. Like, they're going to stay together on their own and take energy to take it apart. Good, good. Okay, what else? Okay, that's a really good, um, that's a good definition of bond because it's, the, the pinnacle point of a chemical bond is that the arrangement of the electrons and the arrangement of the um, of the atoms themselves are at a lower energy in the bonded form than as its single form, right? That's the whole reason for a chemical bond to take place is for that those two atoms to reach a lower energy level. And that's kind of what we're going to explore a little bit here. Um, why do atoms bond with each other to form compounds? It's because they want to get to a lower energy. And why do how do atoms bond to form with other compounds? There's two main types of chemical bonds. What are they? Covalent. Covalent and? Ionic. Good. Ionic and covalent bonds. Those are the two main types. There's also metallic bonds that are between two metals. Um, give me the, the basis of what happens in a covalent bond. Do electrons get shared or do electrons get traded? They get shared. Good. In a covalent bond, electrons get shared. In an ionic bond, electrons get traded, right? Give and take. And so we're going to dive into each of those a little bit more. We're going to look really, really closely at ionic bonds and how they form um, probably next week a little bit more in a pretty interesting kind of cycle that we'll look at. But um, there's basically a trade and there's a give and take. So a chemical bond, there's, believe it or not, there's not like a set definition for this. I mean, there is a book definition, but it has to be so complex to cover the different types of bonds. But generally, a bond is said that forces that hold together groups of atoms and make them function as a unit. Um, and like Jake brought up, which was great, um, it says a bond will form if the energy of the combination is lower than that of when they are separated. Okay, did I leave some fill in the blanks for you here? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, that's an important part for us to remember, and I don't really go over that a whole lot in Chem 1, that they're reaching a lower energy level, but that's true. That's why the, the bond takes place. Otherwise, why bother, right? If atoms have to work harder to be in a bond, why would they do that, right? They just want to be in a lower energy level. So that's really what they're aiming for. Um, all right, let's see here. Here is two hydrogen atoms separately. Right now they're becoming having um, like interaction, but it's not like a full bond yet. And then we have an H2 molecule where it's the lowest energy possible for those two atoms. Okay, we're also going to look at it on a graph to show the difference here, right? Here's an energy level when they're pretty far apart. They get closer together, which has a decrease in energy level. This is where we see an H2 molecule form. So we see a full hydrogen bond. What's the problem here? Why do we see an increase in energy level here? Can you see a difference between this one and this one? They're too close together, right? They're too close together. It doesn't happen that often. This would happen to be um, like in a forced situation because usually when things bond, they configure themselves in their optimum arrangement. So their electrons are spaced right. The, the nucleus are spaced far enough from each other. There's not much of, as much repelling. Um, but in general, they're going to space themselves correctly. So you see here, if they get too close, then we see an increase in energy levels, even more so when they're hanging out by themselves. So this would be a, like, kind of a, a situation in which the hydrogen atoms were like under stress, right? It's too much energy um, so for them to be... We want them lower. Right, we want lower energy levels. We want them to be relaxed, right? Just like all of you, you want low energy as possible, right? It's fine, you didn't even laugh. Okay. <laughs> all right, ionic bonding. This is where we talk about electrons are transferred or traded or there's a give and take, right? In an ionic bond, that's what happens. In a covalent bond, we see, we see that the electrons are shared equally by both nucleus, right? The nuclei of each, the nucleus of each um, atom gets to count those electrons as their own, okay? So in Chem 1, we're working on this a bunch right now, is drawing the Lewis structures and completing the octets. We're going to see some of that, but I want to dive a little bit into ionic ones first. So um, if we see ionic bonding, we see a complete transfer. If we see purely covalent, we see a perfect sharing. What happens for ones that are in the middle? Do you remember? There's a, a name for a covalent bond in which things are not shared totally evenly. 
remember what that's called. Starts with a P. A polar covalent bond. A polar molecule or a polar bond tells us that they're sharing electrons, but they're not sharing them evenly. Right? Does that ring a bell? We at least heard that term before. Polarity and polar bonds. So when we see a polar bond in a, or a polar separation in a bond, we see that one atom is pulling the electrons closer to itself than the other, right? Remember, we think about polarity kind of as a tug of war, right? Somebody's pulling on those electrons harder than the other. And so we'll see um, that separation of charges um, result in a polar bond. And if it happens over the whole molecule, we'll see a polar molecule, right? We'll see electrons being pulled one way so much that we'll see a charge form within the molecule itself. So we're going to look at that here as well. So is H2O like a covalent bond? H2O is a covalent bond, right? They share those electrons. It happens with covalence um, because it's two nonmetals, right? We didn't say that for our earlier ones, but ionic bonds are usually between a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent bonds are usually between two nonmetals. Just like when we named molecules. Remember we did ionic and covalent naming? It's the same thing, right? That's where those names come from. Okay, here is a hydrogen fluorine molecule or a hydrofluoric acid molecule. Um, and its presence within or without or outside of an electric field, okay? So look at here, these, these hydrogen fluorine molecules or hydrofluoric acid, whatever. They're floating around. They have no real sense of direction, but there's a hydrogen and a fluoride for each one, okay? Do you remember when we talked about the trend for electronegativity within a molecule? Which element is the most electronegative element? Mm -hmm. It's fluorine. So between a hydrogen and a fluorine, which one wants the electrons more? Fluorine. fluorine, right? Fluorine is more electronegative. So it takes on what we call this partial negative charge, right? The partial, this is like a Greek letter. I don't really remember what it's called. But it's a Greek letter and it says partial. So it means partial positive, partial negative. When the electrons are pulled closer to fluorine, it's not full on taking them yet, but it's like hogging them, right? And so it's taking on this partial negative charge. That leaves hydrogen with a partial positive charge, right? So the electrons in this bond, let's say here's a bond between the fluorine and hydrogen. Here's fluorine's electron, here's hydrogen, right? It's like, I think of it as kind of a sliding scale within that bond. Now, this is not actually what happens in real, real life, but it gives us a visual to kind of picture what's happening, okay? These electrons are being pulled, and so that results in fluoride taking on this partial negative, hydrogen taking on partial positive. So what in it? Polar. Yeah, this would be a polar bond, exactly, right? There's enough difference between these to be considered a polar bond. And so when we see polar bonds happening, we see the molecules that are floating around with these partial positives and partial negatives. What happens, what's the difference here when we see the electric field? What happened to all these molecules? They're like in the same direction. Right, they're going in the same direction because it says here's the negatively charged side of the electric field, here's the positively charged side of the electric field. So why are all the hydrogens facing that way? Because they don't need opposites attract, right? Hydrogen takes on a partially positive charge, so it wants to be close to the negative side. Fluorides take on a partial negative, which means it wants to be close to the, the positive side. So it's lined them up um, according to that, to that partial positive, partial negative. Would a nonpolar molecule have a change in that electric field? No, right? If there's not an uneven distribution of the electrons, you wouldn't see a change. Uh, when we enter an electric field. So, would that be just an ionic compound? No, it would be, it's, it's a sharing of electrons because it's between two nonmetals, so it's still covalent, but okay. it's a polar covalent. They're not being shared evenly. All right, let's see here. All right, so we're going to touch a little bit more on electronegativity. We said fluorine was the most electronegative element. Sorry, I put that at the bottom, but should be on the top. Um, what electronegativity is, is the ability of an atom within a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. Okay, that's a really good definition for um, electronegativity. It's got to be an atom that's within a molecule, and it attracts the shared electrons to itself. Okay, so it wants to pull electrons away. This is just an example. So if we're in a molecule H with X, so any sort of X compound, usually a nonmetal, 
Um, the electronegativities are determined by comparing, comparing the bond energy with the expected bond energy. So what's actually happening in the bond versus what was supposed to happen, right? That allows us to kind of compare the electronegativities. We also have um, something called the Pauling scale where we have all of those values determined already. And that's on your colored sheet I gave you with your, your periodic trends. You don't have to pull it out right now, but that has all the electronegativity values on there. So that might be something we reference um, a little bit later, okay? Here's the Pauling scale as well. Fluorine is by far the most electronegative element. It increases as we move up, right? That was the overall trend, was that it just points toward fluorine. Wait, why isn't helium up there? Um, helium has, an, it's a noble gas, or it's got a complete octet, so it's, it would be rare that it would have an electronegativity value. So, and then francium is the lowest. Right. Because none of the noble gases are here. Helium, neon, krypton, are, none of them are listed there. In yours, I think they gave them electronegativity values once you got to like krypton, but pretty low still. Okay, let's check on this. If lithium and fluorine react, which has more attraction for an electron? Fluorine. Which one? Fluorine. Gotta be fluorine, right? Lithium and fluorine react, which has more attraction for the electron? Fluorine is the most electronegative element, so it's going to win all the time, no matter what, right? Next one, if a bond between chlorine and iodine, which has more attraction for an electron? Chlorine. chlorine, right? Let's review a little bit about why chlorine wants electrons more than iodine. It's higher up, closer to chlorine. Closer to fluorine, good. That's one reason, which is true. Closer but to the nucleus. Perfect, closer to the nucleus, right? Its valence electrons are closer to the nucleus, so it wants that completed octet more so than iodine. Very good. Well, it's only got three energy shells, right? It's got three levels of electron shells. Iodine has five, right? So iodine's last electron is five shells away from the nucleus. But chlorine's outer shell electrons are only three away. Does that make sense? Okay. Oops, sorry. There you go. All right, here is our differences in bond types. We go from a, a non-polar covalent bond to a polar covalent bond to an ionic bond based on the differences in electronegativities of those two elements, right? So these values, I think you guys need to write these ones in, okay? I think you need to write those ones in. And then why don't you locate that Pauling scale I gave you, and we'll just check a couple of them. Uh, it's on the, the periodic trends handout I gave you, the colored one. Uh-huh. It's like you just subtract. Right, exactly. All we're going to do is subtract. So let's say we wanted to find out what type of bond um, is found between hydrogen and sulfur. Okay, let's look at what type of bond would be found if hydrogen and sulfur bonded. Okay, what's hydrogen's electronegativity? 2.2. What's sulfur's? Um, 2.58. 2.58. So all you're going to do is subtract like bigger minus smaller, right? That's it. Bigger minus smaller. So 2.58 minus 2.2 gives us a difference of 0.38. So it would be a zero. Right. It would be a considered a covalent bond or maybe even more specifically, you might write in that this is called a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay, this one's pretty close, right? There's still a little bit of unevenness in the sharing, but it's not enough that it would form that partial positive, partial negative, right? It's, it's pulling on it a little bit more, but it's not like, it's not enough to make it form that partial. So which one of those elements would want the electrons more? The sulfur, sulfur or hydrogen? The sulfur. Right, they would be inching towards sulfur, right? If we're looking at electrons in that bond, here's sulfur, Maybe here's hydrogens, right? It's still really pretty close to hydrogen, but it wants it a little bit more. So since it's 0.3, it's between the zero. Right, it's 0.38 fits in between zero and 0.4. So it's covalent. Right, so it's considered nonpolar covalent. Okay. What about a bond between sodium and chloride? Right, what about what happens in sodium chloride? What's sodium's? 
0.93. And what's chlorine? 3.1. Okay. 3.16. You can already tell here, without even doing the math, what's it going to be? It's going to be ionic, right? Because the difference is going to be over 2 something. So, what's another clue for us that this is going to be an ionic bond? It's a metal and a non-metal, right? So that's another clue. All right, good. We're going to go ahead and stop there for today.